Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. I have a new strategy for developing these videos that I'm going to tr be trying out with you here. Uh, two episodes ago now, I shared with you the result of generating a figure that was a reproduction of something that I saw published. And back in August, I actually used uh, as fodder, if you will, for kind of teaching people how I think through building a figure. Uh, if you want to get back to that previous newsletter uh, down below in the notes, you'll find a link. You'll also find a link down there as well as up here to the previous episode. That figure was taken from this paper that was published in the journal M-Sphere, which is published by the American Society for Microbiology. It is a open access journal. I like using these journals uh, because it's uh, provides me with figures that anybody can use, including you. Right. So the paper uh, was exploring novel microbial metabolites and drugs for inhibiting Clostridioides difficile. This is a horrible pathogen that is really wrecking havoc in at least the U.S. healthcare system. And so this was published by Ahmed um, Aboukaler, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing these names, and Mohamed Salim um, back in uh, June of 2024. I don't really know a whole lot about the paper, except that they had a really interesting figure, uh, figure one, that I'm sharing with you here. Um, and so previously, I only showed figure 1A, but there's also a B component that kind of describes the funneling, if you will, of the 527 total compounds that they evaluated to get down to eight top hits. The figure on the left indicates the 63 strong hits that were above 90% inhibition of bacterial growth, as well then as the uh, 460 some, uh, 464 maybe, other hits that were below 90%. So what I want to do in this episode is go beyond showing you how to make the figure, but show you my thinking about a figure. And so when I see a figure like this, what am I thinking and kind of what, um, you know, what would I perhaps do differently? Uh, and there is no perfect figure. The data we work with are really complicated. And so ultimately the figure we use is gonna be tied into the story that we're trying to tell, right? And again, I'm not involved in this research. Um, and so um, I, I do wanna grant the authors a bit of the benefit of the doubt. But again, as I look at this figure, there's a few things that stick out to me. So first of all, panel B on the right, I probably would have put on the left, right? And that's because A is actually this first step of finding the 63 strong hits. And so to me, at least, this is kind of right to left storytelling as published. And so if you put B on the left, then you could say, we started with this big library, we went down to 63 strong hits, and look, look over to the right, that's what we've got here, right? Something else as I was looking at this I thought about would be, you know, as you kind of go through each of these different types of hits, it might be interesting to know which of these compounds corresponded to these different types of hits. Where are the eight top hits in all of this? That being said, that might not totally be useful because uh, the x-axis is meaningless, right? So that's another critique I have is that um, they're kind of giving us a sense that the x-axis means something, but it, it doesn't really. It could be any order. I suspect they do have a specific order here because there is some structure to the data. But one of my critiques, again, is that they, the x-axis is meaningless. And so there's probably a better way of visualizing this data, and that would be to use something like a histogram or a density plot. The other thing, um, I'm pretty sure this was made in something like Prism. Um, my experience with GraphPad Prism is that everything in GraphPad Prism comes out kind of looking really chunky. And I don't know if it's because I've been using ggplot2 for so long, where we have really nice light and simple elements to our figures, but the real thick lines and everything really sticks out to me. Also, I don't find these colors super appealing, um, and, and so much of the plot is being tied towards negative data, right? So all this stuff that's in this gold color um, is negative result, right? That all goes into these compounds that didn't make it through the first filter, whereas what's interesting is up here, right? And so these, are, again, are some of the things that I'm thinking through as I go through looking at and interpreting these data. So again, in the previous episode, I made this figure, which I think was a pretty good reproduction of it. I didn't have access to the original data, and so um, mine looks a bit different than theirs, but again, my overall goal was to try to reproduce the figure as the original authors had generated it. Um, and so these are the data that I'm gonna be working with 
in my code. Here I am in our studio. This is the code that I used to generate simulated data. Um, one thing that I did add in the last episode was to create a column called strong. So I'll go ahead and run everything here and we get sim data, which again is a data frame. Um, everything we're using is coming from the tidyverse. And so this is a tibble. And so I've got a column for the compound, the level of inhibition, and whether or not it was a strong or weak hit. Um, I guess it was whether it was a strong hit, right? Because I have true if it was strong, false if it wasn't strong. Um, and so we could might think about doing something like uh, count on sim data uh, strong. And we find that there are 63 strong hits and 464 not strong hits, right? So what I want to do to overcome some of the critique I had of that original figure is to make a box plot or perhaps a density plot. So I'm going to go ahead and take sim data and pipe that to ggplot. And then for my mapping, which I achieved with that AES or short for aesthetics function, the only aesthetic that we need for a box plot is X. And so I'll go ahead then and do on X percent inhibition. And so again, that's the variable that's going to be on the X axis. And then to that, we'll go ahead and do geome histogram. And so geome histogram is one of those functions that applies a statistical processing as well as plotting the data. Something else like this would be like a box plot, right? Where you, again, take the data, you figure out like the median, the quartiles, the outliers, and then you plot it, right? So where something like uh, geome point doesn't really have a statistical layer to it. It presents the data as the data are in the column. Here, we're doing a transformation, a statistical transformation of the data before we go ahead and plot it. So again, this gives us our initial histogram. We have those points that were, of course, above 90%. One of the things you always will get with geome histogram is an indication of the bins, the number of bins that it used. Here it used 30 bins. A better value could perhaps be picked with bin width. And I agree with that. So let's go ahead and here then and do bin width. And let's start with 10. And so that's gonna give us pretty chunky bars, if you will. Um, and let's go down to, let's say, uh, five, and that gets much more fine. One of the things I start to see as you get smaller and smaller bins in a histogram is you kind of this like sawtooth appearance, right? You get like these spikes that appear. Um, and if we went down to say like uh, two, then you certainly see a lot more of that spikiness, right? Um, and so if we did three, five, we saw already, and seven, Seven might be a good trade-off between being so coarse that everything kind of clumps together versus being so um, finely uh, scaled that everything becomes really spiky. So I'm gonna stick with this as my bin width. And you can then clearly see kind of the two different types of bins um, of the, the strong and the weak. I'm gonna go ahead then and add another aesthetic and that's gonna be for the fill to be the, the strong column. And so I'm gonna color whether it was a strong or weak uh, hit by that strong column by changing the fill color of those different bars. So what we find is that our weak hits are the salmon color and our strong hits are this teal color. Uh, we find that there is one hit right up against uh, that 90 border and, um, and that's good. And so that looks pretty decent. Um, I'm not a big fan of these colors. One thing I wanna do um, just to experiment is to see what happens if we throw a fitted line over the data. And so that's a different type of plot, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and copy these first two lines and add in then geome density. And so geome density will draw a density curve over these data. So this plot looks kind of funky in my eyes, right? Uh, because it's treating it as two distributions of data rather than all of the data being from the same distribution, if that makes sense, right? So when I think of screening all those compounds, those compounds percent inhibition are all part of a single distribution, um, and we're pulling them apart to highlight what's high, right? what's above some threshold versus uh, what's below that threshold. And so we're getting two density distributions here, which is a bit odd, right? Uh, not exactly what I'm, I'm looking for. Also, the, the y-axis is a density. And so what that's saying is that like at 0% inhibition, that we would expect like 1.5% of our hits to have that level of inhibition, right? Um, and so 
I'm not really a fan of doing it that way because we have actual data that we looked at here where we could see at 0% inhibition, we had about 40 to 50 uh, hits, right? Again, depending on where the breaking of the x-axis happens to make those different bins. Something we could think about doing is merging these two plots. So let's go ahead and do that down below here. And again, we have our histogram and we can add to that geome density. And so what we find then is that the density is at the very bottom because as we saw two plots ago, right? Uh, this is a much smaller y-axis scale than what we had with the histogram. And so something we could do is we could put the density on the histogram scale or the histogram on the density scale. And so to do the density on the histogram scale, we can do something that I think is a pretty cool trick that has recently been added to ggplot, I found, which would then to be to do AES. So we'll do after underscore stat, and then we'll do count. So basically what we're saying is after you run count on the data, we're then going to use that as the y-axis. And so again, what we get is a continuous distribution of the data, um, which doesn't totally fit with the histogram of the data. And so this looks a bit odd to me, right? Um, I'm not totally liking that, and it certainly doesn't line up with the actual data. Alternatively, we could put the histogram on the density scale. Again, we would do something very similar here, where we would put the AES up here, and after stat um, count, we would instead do density. And so now what we get is we get our density curves, and you can kind of see the, uh, the, the bars behind that, right? And so, so what we might think about doing in geom density then would be like fill equals NA, and then we get our, our distributions here. But now what we see is that it's actually plotting it as a single distribution rather than as two distributions, right? Um, and so perhaps a better alternative for experimenting like this would be something like alpha equals say 0 0.2. And so now we see that we've got uh, the density distribution for both of these sets of data um, and it's scaled to the density. But again, the density isn't doing a great job of reflecting um, the bins. Something else that I notice about this that's a little bit odd that I can see more clearly with um, kind of the, the, the true data is that this line comes down and then it goes all the way across the x-axis like a 0% probability, right? And then you can kind of see that the, the false does the same thing where it goes across. You could perhaps see this more clearly if we also did like uh, color equals uh, strong, where you can see that the teal line goes under the salmon bars and the salmon line goes under the teal bars. So I think this is an interesting strategy for some applications. But again, what we're looking at here is a single distribution, but they're picking off the, the high uh, percent inhibition points. And so again, what we have is a single distribution where we're highlighting things that were in that high percent um, inhibition. So I'm going to go ahead and comment out uh, that code. If you want to play with it later, the code will be available at the blog post for today's episode. I'll leave that in there. You can find that blog post down below in the comments. So let's return to this plot and let's go about seeing if we can make this more worthy of being a publication quality. So to get going, I'm going to do gg save and I will then call this um, inhibition histogram dot png um, and we'll go ahead then and do width equals um, six height equals four so i like to generate the image in the dimensions and format that i want to use it for because when i start moving things around um, by like changing sizes of text or whatever um, it always gets a bit funky when i use the plotting window here in our studio so i prefer to have it look like it's going to look in the final figure. So here's what that looks like, right? And so we have, I think, a nice aspect ratio here. Um, I don't need it to be super tall, kind of like I have over here um, in the y-axis. And so I wanna start customizing this to make it look more attractive. So I'm gonna start by changing the theme of my figure, as well as changing the labels on my axes. And so we've seen this before, but again, we'll do uh, theme classic, and then we'll do labs. And then for X, we'll do what I had before was inhibition 
of bacterial growth. I like to keep things a uh, lowercase, like sentence case, right? Bacterial growth, and then to put the percent in percent sign. Um, in the previous version, they wrote inhibition of bacterial growth percent, right? I would rather have inhibition of bacterial growth and then percent or the unit in parentheses. And then y will be number of compounds. All right, let's go ahead and add that. And so then this is what we get. One thing that I'm not really feeling for this application is the expand on the y-axis. I would like to have no gap here at the bottom. And so again, by default, ggplot2 will add padding, or they call it expansion, around the figure. And so I can get rid of that by going ahead and modifying my scale. And so I can do scale y uh, continuous, and I can do expand equals c0 comma 0. And while I'm at it, I'll go ahead and do scale x continuous, and I'll do limits, and I'll do c negative 100 to 100, and then add a plus. And I'm getting a warning message that it removed four rows containing missing values or values outside the scale. So I think what's happening is that when the histogram breaks my data up into bins, that there's probably something that goes over the 100. Let's go ahead and look at the documentation for geome histogram. And I'm wondering if there's a way to specify the limits, right? And so I'm going to scroll down through here and um, position no, um, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, show legend, inherit AS, bin width. Uh, we've talked about that, bin width versus bins, orientation, um, geome or stat. Uh, center or boundary. Um, only one center or boundary may be specified for a single plot. Center specifies the center of one of the bins. Boundary specifies the boundary between two bins. Note that either is above or below the range of the data. They will be shifted by an appropriate integer, multiple, or bin width. Uh, for example, to center on integers, use bin width equals 1 and center equals 0, even if 0 is outside the range of data. All right. Um, Let's see. Alternatively, you can supply a numeric vector by giving the bin boundaries. Overrides bin width, bins, center, and boundary. I think I like that. Let's go ahead and try that. Now, the other thing I see here then is closed, one of right or left, indicating whether the right or left edges of the bins are included in the bin. So I'm curious what the default is on closed, and it doesn't say what it is. I think the default actually is right. So um, which would be the positive end of things, right? So why don't we, in geome histogram, instead of bin width, I'm going to comment this out for just right now. We'll do geome histogram, and we'll do breaks, and I'll do uh, a sequence vector from minus 100 to 100, and let's do that by fives. And I think that looks pretty decent. Um, again, the data that I used to generate the false data is... Um, from a normal distribution, whereas what the authors had in the original figure was not from a normal distribution as far as I could tell. And so what we get then is um, basically 90 to 95 and 95 to 100 here. And I think that works a lot better. Perhaps in the legend, we could even say the bins are five percentage point uh, wide. So that's pretty good. I like that. The next thing I want to do is go ahead and I'm going to turn everything gray and then I'm going to highlight the hits that I think are most important. And so I got this idea from a woman named Cole nussbaumer Naflick, who encourages people to remove all of the color and then add one piece of color in at a time, highlighting what's most important. And I think that will work really well for this application. Um, and so let's go ahead and do that. And so in here, I'm gonna go ahead and add scale fill continuous, and I will then do breaks and we'll do false and true, and then we'll do values, uh, and we'll do uh, for false, if it's not a good hit, we'll do gray, and then for a positive hit, let's go ahead and do dodger blue, and we'll go ahead and add that. Up, oh, and it's warning me, uh, continuous scale, unused arguments, values, gray, dodger blue. I think I saw scale Y and scale X continuous and thought that here, nope. It's supposed to be scale fill manual. So now what we get, is our gray compounds that were weak hits and our blue compounds that were strong hits. 
you could put in red or whatever. Um, color is one of those things that has a really strong psychological component. So maybe putting in red would make it bright, clear. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'll go ahead and do red. And so now we see, yeah, that really sticks out probably a lot more strongly than the Dodger blue. There's a whole bunch, there's like 99 or 100 different shades of gray that you could use to get a lighter gray or a darker gray, depending on what you want. I'm then going to go ahead and get rid of this legend because I think it's pretty obvious what's the strong hits and what's the weak hits, right? And maybe we can then add an annotation into the plot to indicate what is a strong or weak hit. So let's go ahead then and remove that. And we can remove that from Geom histogram as we saw in the help by doing show.legend equals false. That goes away and it also gives us more breathing space from left to right. And now what I wanna do is go ahead and add to this a annotation indicating the weak hits versus the positive hits. And so we can do that with the annotate function. So I will use geom annotate. And to use geom annotate, you first give it a geom. So the first argument is geom and here it will do text. So on the X axis, uh, I'm gonna put in some values to put two labels for the low hits versus the high hits. And so I'll put minus 75 and 75, and I've got one too many negative signs here. And then Y, um, I'll put the labels, say at 35 and 35. And then for labels, I'm gonna have two labels. So I will then say, say some number of compounds were below 90%. And I'll go ahead and put a line break in here so that it's not a really long label, okay? So I'll say 63 compounds were above 90%, okay? And let me just double check the number, 63 and 464. All right, and then again, I'm gonna to wanna to put in a backslash N here. So let's go ahead and add our plus sign, run this and see where we get it. Oh, and I've got an error that I've got geom annotate, and this is supposed to be straight up annotate, not a geom. And I'm getting an error about scale X continuous which makes me think that somehow um, I might have parentheses off here. And uh, I've got uh, my C function up here has a parentheses there and it should be down here. Let's try that again. And I think I used the wrong label. I think I used labels instead of label. Let's do that. See, I learn things or forget things along the way. Cool, that's looking pretty nice. I'm gonna go ahead and take this label and maybe move it over a little bit. And I think I'm gonna make it red so it really pops and makes it clear that this red text corresponds to that red um, set of bars. And this text, I'm gonna move down a little bit and I'm gonna make it the same color gray so it's more clear that those go together. Um, I think perhaps I could even put this inside of the distribution. Why don't I do that? And I'll leave it black and put it inside the distribution which will make it clear that that's what we're doing. All right, so this might take a little bit of iteration to get things in the right place. So for that, let's start with that first one. So I'm gonna put that at zero. Um, and the Y, let's go ahead and put at say five. Very good. Um, and it seems to be centering it at the zero, right? Um, and if I make it bold, I wonder what happens. So uh, let's go ahead and then add uh, face equals, uh, let's just do bold, maybe it's font face. So those are nice. Uh, it is a little bit thick and clunky, but I think that's fine. And then let's go ahead and move this label out of the out of the bar. And so it does seem to be centering the label on the on the value we picked of 75. So let's move it over to say like 65 and see how that treats us. So we'll then do color uh, as a vector. We'll do black and red. Uh, and that looks pretty nice. One thing I noticed is I think it is center justified. I wanna go ahead and make it left justified. That might screw things up, but it does seem a little bit odd to have a gap here to the left of the 63. And so we can achieve that in here by doing like H just equals zero. And so H just is the horizontal justification. Zero is left, one is right, and 0.5 is the center. And so of course that moves things around a little bit, but we can, again, move our X values over. So my X value for the non-hit, I'll do negative 25. And for the Y, I'll do 50. One problem with trying to center things on like zero is that it makes it really hard to get it right. Um, because these two lines are about the same length, I might leave this 
centered justification on zero and then move this over a little bit but keep it left justified. And so again, we're giving it vectors and the first value in the vector then corresponds to basically what I'm saying is below 90% and the second is above 90%. So I'll do 0 0.5 for zero and then um, put this back to zero um, for the, the below and then this I'll put to say 45. So it looks pretty good, don't you think? One thing I notice is that I've got numby of compounds. It should be number. So let's come back up to that. I think someone yelled that to me and I, I thank you. I'm sorry I didn't hear you initially. So I like this. Um, one thing that I will still critique myself is that there's a lot of real estate in this plot that is going towards negative data, right? That this big gray chunk is negative um, really sticks out to me. And I'm wondering like, why is this getting so much prominence in the data? Um, if I think back to the original figure where they had that panel B with the rest of the flow of compounds going through their screening protocol, I might think about, you know, adding in those different candidates um, as different fill colors, right? And so we could perhaps, if there were like two or three other levels, additional, um, additional colors and perhaps annotation for each of those. And we could change this text, right? It is a little bit weird to have basically the same label for both of these 63 compounds are above 90 percent 464 are below 90 percent right um and so i i could play with this a lot right but again my goal here is to think about how we can take that original plot that we regenerated in the last episode and convert it to something that i think does a perhaps better job of telling that story and so here are those two figures side by side um i do like kind of the lighter uh, theme elements compared to what we had in the previous version. Again, I think this is a, perhaps a difference between like GraphPad Prism and ggplot. I think this does a nice job of showing the distribution, whereas here you're asking your reader to go left and right with their eyes to basically try to stack up the data to build something like this in their own head. Um, and so that's again one of the reasons why I prefer this version of the figure. Is it perfect? No, um, but this I think is a pretty good start for what I can do here in about half an hour or so on this video. Let me know what you think. As always, um, I really welcome your feedback. I would love to see what types of figures that you all are working with. Um, you know, go to your browser. I'm sure you've got a bunch of tabs open. Go to that first uh, figure that you find in one of those tabs and, and shoot me an email at pat at riffamonis.org. And I'd love to highlight that in a future newsletter and series of episodes like this. All right. Well, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.